I wanted to start with a question for you, Seth. Um, I think it's so interesting how you know your mission now is to try and make fair trade available to people who, um, to, to the average person, the Walmart shopper. Um, and that took some scale, right? Um, and it took time to get there. Yeah. What advice would you give um, people who are who have smaller businesses who, yeah. who haven't quite gotten there? What what is what is what can they do to try and democratize fair trade? I think part of it is it does take patience. Like I say, that long curve, um, and and hopefully it's hopefully the the slope is accelerating. So, but but I think you know the key um, we learned early on, and we had lots of failures along the way, is don't let your mission get ahead of the consumer. And what I mean by that is we had some we had this amazing tea we had brought out from it was from South Africa it was Honeybush um, and it was just like this really amazing community partnership it was um, the farmers owned the the heck the land that where it was grown and they actually owned the processing as well so they were capturing all the value add and we we're so passionate about it and we had art from the um, the garden from one of the artists in the garden on the label when I described that tea to you I never talked about taste and it turns out it didn't taste good. <laughs> so you've got to make sure um, your product tastes great. Like the, you can't, like you can't be, oh, it's great for fair trade, or oh, it's great, you know, uh, except we've got some funky ingredients as as we did with this one. Like it just, you have to meet the consumer um, need. You have to. So I think too often, and I'm I'm in this group, we get so excited about our mission and our impact that we we fail to remember the the person who's going to be buying it, which is the consumer. Yeah, so it needs to compete with any other product in the market. Exactly. Um, so I have a question uh, for the group, but I'm going to start with you since we've, we've just heard from you. So you've been in this business for decades now. Um, and, <laughs> that's that's and harsh when you I know, that's <laughs> harsh. Um, and so it's, it, you know, you've seen this evolution. Yeah. You, you yourself as a brand have evolved. Yeah. You've become more widespread. Um, what have you seen about the rest of your industry? I mean, how has the rest of the industry uh, kept kept along this progressive bent? Um, it's moving that way. The, you know, when we started, obviously there were no other organic teas. There are more organic teas now. Um, I wish I could say there are. There certainly are more fair trade teas, but there's not a ton. Uh, bottled teas, at least, there's not a ton. I love the quote from um, the CEO of Patagonia. Um, she said, "Make it um, sufficiently uncomfortable for your competitors not." To to follow you, you know. So we try to create that pressure, um, but I would say we're still early. And and look, we're okay being early. I'm not I'm not complaining. That's that's how you get an advantage is first mover. But uh, sometimes it takes time for others to catch up or the market to catch up. And and that you know there's a cost to that. And that's and that's true not just of uh, tea of you're course. saying, but also everything else in like the Target food yeah food department yeah yeah. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's yeah. why that's why this community. <laughs> is so critical, right? Like you, we are the demand makers. Like, I mean, we're, we're providing the, the solution, but you know, I, I use the same analogy when I talk about Beyond Meat, like Beyond Meat's a great product, but if it weren't for all of the vegan, vegetarian activists, uh, and you know, then um, to help accelerate and create awareness, you know, then we're just a product. And Al, what, what are you seeing in the world of coffee? We hear a lot about fair trade coffee. I mean, what is your insight about what's going on in that industry? Okay. Is this on? Mm -hmm. um, well, coffee being the first fair trade product that came into the U.S. market, uh, you know, it's been a while since it really became a mainstream um, offering. And back in the sort of early days, I would say, which would be the 2000s, uh, within the specialty coffee industry, uh, there was a very vocal uh, and growing um, camp of roasters who were very into fair trade and, and wanted to spread it and, and increase volume. But there was um, also an emerging voice of naysayers who questioned fair trade um, for several reasons, but one of them was that it, it didn't actually represent high quality coffee. And because the specialty coffee industry was really trying to distinguish itself from commercial coffee, um, the whole sort of premise of that and the potential of the industry and the market uh, were based on that premise that the, the product in the cup was actually better. And, um, and why was that? I mean, what was it that the non-fair trade brands were paying more? Or I mean, like, what what was going on there that made it that way? I think uh, there were a lot of things going on. One of which was just this uh, skepticism that 
this was real, that that this represented something that was actually sustainable for the industry, not in terms of economic or environmental social sustainability, but at business sustainability. Is this really a viable product? And if fair trade really ramps up and grows, can this can the producers, can these cooperatives actually deliver high quality coffee in every single shipping container? And there were cases in which some didn't deliver on that promise. Um, the, the quality was not consistent. Um, but it's been a while since that that period, and there are fair trade clubs around the world, um, particularly in Latin America, I would say, that really have distinguished themselves based on quality to the point where they are selling coffee to naysayers hmm. based on the quality alone. And so these are roasters who aren't licensees of Fair Trade USA or Fair Trade America, and they they may be against the idea of fair trade um, or the certification or or paying a licensing fee but they're buying this coffee because it's damn good coffee. And to me, that's an ultimate success story when a co-op can sell repeatedly to a naysayer and, and that coffee will still be purchased on fair trade terms. So is it now table stakes in the industry to be fair trade or are there still many people who are resisting going into it? I think things have kind of settled. Uh, you know who the fair trade licensees are, you know who the ones um, who maybe used to be and then pulled out of the system. There was this whole uh, movement towards direct trade that came out maybe around 20, 2009, 2010. Um, that's still present, um, but I think what we've really seen over the past maybe six to eight years is these cooperatives really investing in quality and making that a priority and distinguishing themselves based on the quality of their product. Got it, got it. And Laura, tell us about the, the food um, service industry. Um, so. I'm going to date myself just to make you feel better. Thank you. <laughs> but 20 years ago when I was in college, um, I don't think I, I ever heard anything about um, any of the food in any of my cafeterias being, um, you know, tasty for one, uh, but, but much less, uh, you know, fair trade. So it, it, tell us about how the industry has been evolving there. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's changed a lot. Uh, I've been with Chartwells for 13 years, and when I first started, there wasn't even mention of fair trade, certainly, um, even some organic. It was every once in a while it would come up. Uh, and I think, I know there's a lot of college students here today. You all are really the ones driving and changing and shifting that demographic. It, it first started with students coming to us asking us as their food service provider to increase the quality of the food on their plates through organics and, and sourcing some fair trade options. Um, but it's, it's spread now such that even contracts are including requirements for fair trade and organic options in all you care to eat dining venues. So it's definitely changed a lot and it's something that a lot of our colleges and universities are looking for. From, from my perspective as a consumer of that food, it seemed like it was very price driven, um, especially you know, at that kind of scale, like dining halls. Um, and so you know, talking about democratizing fair trade and you know, making it more accessible, I mean, does that radically increase the prices? I mean, how does that affect the businesses of these, these campuses? I wouldn't say that it dramatically increases the prices as much as you have to sometimes consider compromises in other areas. So it's about finding some balance. Um, you absolutely, you know, one of the things that I'm very sensitive to is this growing need um, of addressing food insecurity on college campuses. So we want to maintain that, that level of balance so that we're not providing too many options that outprice individuals who are already at a disadvantage. Um, but doing the right thing by finding the right suppliers and the right, um, the right products to put on place. So it's, it's all about the balance and how you build out the whole suite of offerings on a campus. And I just have one more question. Um, I, the other thing that happens, I think, with these large, um, you know, large institutional um, dining facilities is that it just seems like, you know, waste is, is just part of the package, right? Um, and, you know, it, there's always tons of food that isn't getting served. I mean, and so when you start including these more expensive premium ingredients, does that also incentivize these places to stop wasting as much food? Is, that, is it all connected? Actually, I would say because the cost of food can be so volatile anyway, we're really sensitive to managing waste. Um, and that's, that's always been a focus. 
so I don't know that it's necessarily tied to a higher price point on the, the products that we're sourcing. Um, I think a lot of the waste in general is just the way that college food service operates with the all you care to eat environments. And if I can make a shameless plug, <laughs> um, you know, talk to your universities about shifting that model a little bit so that there's not this constant supply of food at the last minute. Yeah. Um, you know, we're doing as much as we can to try to get that food in the hands of individuals who need it, but certainly um, considering some other options to that traditional all you care to eat model would really have a significant impact. Would have waste. certainly spared me my freshman 15, yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm gonna st stick with you, uh, Laura, uh, for a second. So you've, you've talked um, a little bit in the past um, about how you, um, you see many constituencies when you're thinking about fair trade, and one of them is that you know, you're bringing um, students um, you know, within, you know, within some of these systems to see where food is made so that you know, you're sort of helping them understand these processes. Um, I mean, for all of you and, and for, for Laura right now, who do you see as your target audience for um, talking about these issues? Uh, it's everybody that we come into contact with. It's our internal associates and employees because often they lack awareness and understanding of what fair trade means and, and how food is sourced. Um, absolutely our clients and our, our business partners on campuses and of course the students and even to a certain extent their parents. Um, you know, making sure that we're providing as much information as possible um, to as many people as possible is our, our primary goal. And we really do start with the students. Um, you know, you mentioned we just took some students uh, to the Coalition of Immokalee Workers down in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, we have some sustainability interns that we sponsored to go for that, to take on that trip. And it's, um, it's just a really nice grassroots way to increase the students' knowledge base because then they do so much advocacy on their own about spreading the, the word about um, just fair trade and doing the right thing and making sure that we're familiar with our suppliers and where our food's coming from. Do they then apply pressure to their universities as well to, to ch change their practices? Does that help you? Yeah, in a nice way, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, they become really <laughs> solid influencers. Um, and Al, um, tell me a little bit about um, who you're trying to educate about these issues, who you see as your different constituencies. Well, we operate 20 cafes in Milwaukee, Madison, and Chicago. Uh, so our retail customers are obviously a main um, target audience for us. Uh, also, we have a pretty big wholesale business, grocery, independent cafes, restaurants, offices um, that purchase our coffee and, and either resell it or just serve it. Uh, so they're another group. And our, because we've become a larger company, um, primarily made up of retail employees, we have our own employees to educate. And so there's always a new opportunity to, to not just educate about fair trade, but about the producers and origin, as we call sort of the, the general coffee producing world. And that's been a big focus of, of our company for years and years, um, the 25 years that we've been in existence, is to really uh, focus not so much on us, but on the, the places um, and the people from which our coffees come. And so we do that in different ways, uh, through photo, through video. Uh, sometimes we have producers coming to visit us. Um, sometimes they represent fair trade co-ops, other times they don't. But um, I think in general our, you know, we, we just have kind of these three main camps of, of uh, target audiences that, um, that we kind of need to always sort of remind in some way, shape or form that this is a thing that fair trade exists, and that we are an active partner in it. And why is that important? Just kind of at a very basic level, why why is this? Why do you invest this time and money to do that? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think well, it's it's important for obvious reasons. Um, that's the, you know why we're all here um, to to be um, activists and and to promote fair trade products, whether they be sugar, tea, coffee, um, tomatoes, shrimp, you know, just the way that fair trade as a movement has grown over in the 18 years that I've been working in coffee is, is really amazing because it used to just be coffee. And then I remember tea came on board and then chocolate, sugar, and then now you see 
fair trade products all over the supermarket. And for me, having been in the movement for 18 years, um, that's actually kind of the reason I got into coffee was because I discovered this thing called fair trade. And um, it's been amazing to, to watch that growth happen and to feel like, wow, this used to just be in our little industry of coffee and now it's all over the place. Um, so I think it's important to continue educating customers and consumers because it's reminding them, hey, well, not only did it start with coffee, so we've planted that flag, um, but that it's now this, this much bigger thing and you know, we're, we specialize in coffee. We do sell other products, including tea. We do have a fair trade tea. And we um, just want to keep that sort of in front of our customers, even if it's not totally obvious, if, we, if they don't necessarily notice right away that there's a label on the package. Um, but it's something that they might pick up and then notice when they're shopping that there are other products with that same label. Yeah, for sure. And you know, as Seth was saying earlier, um there are still a lot of people who don't fully understand the concept. And so I guess part of it is just kind of explaining that. Um, Seth, I loved your T-Mobile. I think that's really cool. Um, and I think a lot of people um, are pretty separated from the process of, you know, the, of, of tea. We're so, right. you know, we're so divorced from, you know, the natural world that we don't know where our, our food comes from. So I think that's really cool. Um, tell us a little bit more about um, who else you see as your um, as your constituencies and what you're trying to do, and also why? I mean, you know, coming back to this question, I mean, why why is it why is it important to do that? Why is it important to do that and not necessarily just sell your product and, right. and just not talk about it? Right, right, right. Like, right. So, um, I mean, we really are, especially now that we are part of Coca Cola. It's it has to be a large audience. It's not. A, we 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 always want to remind people we're not a niche. We're not a super niche. We really do. If you're, if you're serious about democratizing, you want to be out there. That's why the Wendy's step was so exciting for us, because it's that, you know, there's nobody, <laughs> nobody ever said, oh, let's go to Wendy's for something that's organic and fair trade. Um, you know, so th that we're getting people who, you know, aren't expecting that. Um, and so... Uh, Do they know? I mean, are they, so what is that? They don't, they don't know, and they just, but, but what we did when we launched it with them is it was on the menu, and they, I mean, it certainly didn't, dig deep into what fair trade is, but it did say organic and fair trade. It was a sort of a special... Kind of like, not to be too on the nose, but pl kind of planting a seed, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. Like a... Yeah, exactly. No, so it starts there. Um, and, you know, even if it's, it's not on all the menus now, it's sort of we're doing it in regions, but it's still a big step. And, and you know, um, we just always want to take those steps forward. You know, the, there's obvious reasons. I hope I sort of painted some of them about why this is important, why we should do it. The one that I didn't really speak to, but I, um, and I don't want to sound too new agey, but maybe this audience will forgive me, is, is there's karma. It really is one of these things where it's like, I can't tell you what, um, you know, that eye care program does for our, 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 our brand. Um, I can tell you that there's no downside, there's no negative to it. There's nothing, um, and so I, my, my point of view is like, whenever you, and this is, this, I get a lot of this from India, it's like, when you put out positive energy, um, it just, it, you're, it's, you know, it's, bad things will still happen, but um, you'll, you'll, nothing negative will come out of trying to put out positive energy. I like that. Um, yeah, I like that. Uh, I was a, uh, I was actually, I studied Tamil literature actually uh, oh, um, in grad school. So I think that, that there's something very beautiful about that. Before I move into the next line of inquiry, I would just love to hear a little bit. I mean, we're talking to an audience of people who know a lot about fair trade, but you know, as, as people who are sort of interfacing with consumers, what are some misconceptions or things that people don't understand about fair trade right now? Yeah. I, I, I'd love to start if I could. I mean, one of them is that it's not all peaches and cream. Like, it's tough. Um, we've got, so I mentioned the, the tea gardens in northern India. These are, we, um, one of the gardens we source from um, had come in, they came, there was an, basically an abandoned tea garden. So this community had no economic livelihood. Um, some partners came in and started up a tea garden, and then a, um, a German uh, film company came in and shot a video, which basically, uh, which was you know labeled an expose. But if there was an expose, it was basically you know, you know, discovery. People are poor in India. You know, there's parts of India where people are poor. It's like, yeah, and people there's not you know um, sanitary bathrooms for the women who pick the tea leaves. These are, these are facts, and um, I think it's dangerous when people impose their, their economic lens on a country, and, and it's unfortunate. So we, uh, 
and you know we're working with fair trade but basically once the once the tea garden lost its fair trade certification we couldn't buy from them any longer and of course that's even worse for that community and we're working with fair trade and we worked with the community and they've had a major improvement plan there recertification comes up in april we hope i mean it's it, it's good tea we'd love to be able to work with them again but um that's that is a challenge when um, you look through one lens and, and don't really sort of understand it from, from the ground. And that's a little, I, I will say, when I show that the school in India, I, don't, I certainly don't want you leaving thinking, oh my gosh, tea, you know, people working in tea gardens, you know, all get to wear uniforms to school and have amazing school buses. That, that's not the case. How about, how about you guys, what, what um, misconceptions are you seeing on the ground when, when you talk about fair trade, things that you have to sort of correct? Um, so I think our, our biggest misconceptions don't necessarily come from our student population because I think they're more in touch with what fair trade is and, and what it provides. But um, some of our clients and even internally, um, some of our associates and managers don't really fully understand the scope of what fair trade means and what that can provide back to a local community. Um, you know, they wouldn't necessarily associate fair trade with water and, you know, providing glasses and, and health care and um, women's education and things of that nature. So I think that going back to that education discussion and making sure that everyone understands what fair trade really is, is continues to be an important part of that discussion because um, to your earlier point, it can just be seen as a more expensive product. What does that really mean? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think one of the things that we've um, noticed and, and heard quite a bit about ever since we became active with fair trade, uh, dating back to 2001, 2002, um, is just sort of a, a lack of understanding of how the process that coffee producers have to go through to actually get into the fair trade system. They have to form a cooperative and then the cooperative has to apply for certification and has to meet a number of really strict standards, and they have to maintain those standards. They are audited uh, year after year. And so it's not this very simple, like, sign up and let's be part of this. It's they have to um, go through all these steps, get the certification, they have to pay for it. Um, I don't remember what the exact cost is these days for a co-op to be certified, but it's not necessarily cheap. and. They have to, um, and then after they get certified, it's not a guarantee they're going to sell their coffee through the fair trade market. There has to be a buyer who's willing to, to pay the fair trade price. And even the most successful coffee co-ops around the world don't sell all their coffee at the fair trade price. They just don't. Um, there, aren't, there still isn't enough demand for that. Or they sell the better quality at the fair trade price and then the lower quality they just sell on the local market. So I think just uh, an awareness of how fair trade really works um, on the ground with the certification process and uh, what they have to go through to, to get that certification, I think that is, those are the technicalities that aren't as exciting or sexy. They don't get talked about because it's just kind of the nuts and bolts. But that does have an impact on, on how fair trade really works and, and what's available, what might not be available and um, why certain licensees may not be 100%. If I could, I, just yeah. to share with you, because um, it, 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 you know, it, it's definitely not a perfect process. There is a lot of gray. And I remember one year we were working on our mission report, and we, we, you, we, we always work with Fairtrade USA to make sure they're comfortable with the language. And we said something like, Fairtrade seeks to ensure workers are paid a fair living wage. And um, the Fairtrade USA folks said, don't say seeks to ensure, it ensures. And I'm like, I. I just, our goal is, always, the only way to really be honest is to always be under promise. And so, so uh, you know, um, we're very fortunate in the 21 years there hasn't been an expose that we, you know, we aren't living up to our words. But the only way to do that is just to make sure you under promise. We, we end up following fair trade's request. But I, I just um, am mindful that when you're dealing with extreme poverty conditions, um, it, there's a challenge, there's a challenge and, and what, you know, some people, it's just different definitions can make it harder. Yeah, and these are very complex supply chains. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there's lots of moving parts that it sometimes can be hard to um, micromanage yeah. every part of it. Yeah. Um, so now I want to turn to a generational question. Um, so, uh, so I'm like the 
like the very end of the millennial um, generation. Um, I'm 35, um, and I've been I've been always so interested to hear about what um, how generations are defined. It's something that is very interesting to our readers, and so there's all this data that shows that um, millennials and now Gen Z um, have a different approach to consumption than their parents. Um, so, you know, their parents, um, the, the baby boomers, um, were only just, you know, um, seeing products on the market that were organic and fair trade, and that, that, was, that was slowly being mass marketed to them. For millennials and then Gen Z, that, that's kind of the norm. They, yep. were, they were, grew up going to farmer's market, shopping, you know, local, going to, you know, seeing so many brands in Target um, and at Walmart that have organic labels on them. And so I feel like that presents, a, you know, an opportunity and a challenge for you as um, companies that are invested in fair trade. On the one hand, uh, I imagine that, you know, you have your audience right there. These are people who want to buy these products. On the other hand, um, these are people who, um, who, who, who haven't really necessarily learned that much about these systems. You know, they, they sort of like um, grew up with them mm -hmm. all around them. And so they, they you know, it, I'm speaking for myself here, but you know, I, I, I never spent that much time thinking about what it took to certify a fair trade product or an organic product. I just assumed that you know, if it had that label on it, I should buy it, right? So what are, what are the problems th with that? I mean, like, how do you engage young people with this particular type of mentality? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw that over to you first. Uh, geez, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, 33 minutes. <laughs> okay, and counting. Um, this is a, a really good question. I, I'm Gen X. I'm 45, and I grew up in the 80s, um, and I was very skeptical of business in the private sector. I never, ever thought I'd be working in business. And in college, I used to kind of make fun of the undergrad business students because I said they were all greedy. And here I am. Um, so what happened? Actually, it was social entrepreneurship, this idea that business can be a force for positive change in local and global communities. That's really what got me into the private sector and specifically into coffee and fair trade being a vehicle for that. Um, those, are, those are the things, those are the sort of concepts that I, that I really was interested in when I first started working in coffee and somehow was able to make a career out of it. Um, so I think when we're um, talking to customers and employees about things like fair trade that they've um, kind of always had around them, have grown up with. Uh, we have a lot of uh, employees who are the same age as many of you, um, so it's, it's an audience that we're very familiar with. I think it's really just um, taking the time to explain things and to say, well, this is what we do with uh, these supply chains. Some of them are fair trade, some of them are not. Um, and often we get questions, well, why aren't you 100% fair trade? And then we explain. And so I, I think it's really just taking that time to, to engage and not to just brush off the, the um, people who are challenging us or, or making us feel uncomfortable because we're not perfect. Um, we um, do quite a bit of volume of fair trade. We're about 55% um, or about a million pounds of green coffee a year. And we're actively engaged with uh, fair trade co-ops in many different origins. Um, but there's still more that we could do. And um, some of that is even uh, just things that I could personally do as the, as the green coffee buyer and buy a little bit more fair trade and put it in this blend. Uh, so, you know, I think it's, it's this idea of continuous progress that even those who are active in the fair trade movement um, can still do more and can still learn from um, people like yourselves, like activists who are kind of challenging us to um, to think more about this, maybe to think outside the box. At the uh, Business Partners Summit yesterday afternoon, I was talking about um, a program that we have in which our bakery um, and commissary, they're making uh, food items that are inspired by cuisines from coffee producing countries. And so I gave an example of a, of a dish that we're about to roll out at all of our cafes that is, um, a quinoa bowl, and it is inspired by the flavors of Peru. And so someone in the, in the group said, oh, are you using fair trade quinoa? I'm like, oh, right, I didn't think about that. And I don't make the purchasing decisions for the bakery, but I thought, well, that's a really good thing to take back and, um, and just to see, like, is that an option? Can we get that through our suppliers, our vendors? 
and how much would it cost? But to even think about that, you know, me as a sort of longtime um, business uh, participant in fair trade, I just didn't think of it and, um, because it's not coffee. And so I think going back to the question, it's, you know, it's for us to, to listen, to engage, to learn from uh, people who are looking at our business from the outside and to share what we do. And to make that an exchange, it's, it's not this, oh, we're, we've been doing fair trade for all these years, so we know how it is. Obviously, that's not true because I forgot about fair trade quinoa. But it's, you know, having that exchange and having both sides be respectful of each other. Um, and, and for both of you, for Laura, I mean, you're engaging with millennials all the time and, and Gen Z now. Um, I mean, what, what do you see in them and what opportunities are there and, and also challenges? Well, I'm Gen X too, unfortunately, maybe. Um, but fortunately, I, <laughs> maybe. Uh, I agree with you, though, Al. That I learned so much from the consumer base. Um, it's just, it's amazing how different their thought processes are. And and I, uh, I got into this this whole business. I'm a dietitian originally, and realized I could have a bigger impact if I worked on a larger scale. And I think sustainability and fair trade works the same way. But I think it's just a different mindset for Gen Z. Um, I have a 10-year-old daughter at home and attended a conference last year and we were talking about um, these lab-created meats and how, you know, that's the next evolution yeah, of sure. actual animal products being grown in a lab without the animal having to die. And I was explaining this to her because to me, I'm a little bit freaked out by it, to be honest. Um, but I'm explaining this to her, and she looks at me totally flat-faced and says, oh, so I could eat chicken, and the chicken still gets to run around. And it's like, yeah. And she's like, I'd do that. <laughs> she just, so it's just a totally different way of viewing the world that they're bringing to the table that this generation is, is sharing with us. And um, you know, they do consider things that I just hadn't considered, mm -hmm. I think, is, is really the biggest part of it. Is that true for you too? Yeah, Seth? I mean, I think the key is they um, are expect they have an expectation of entitlement to information, and I love that. Like there should be transparency, and they know if they search hard enough, they are going to be able to find videos or information about um, you know whatever they want to learn, and and that's what to me that's the beauty of what you know fair trade ultimately is just about transparency. Right? It means we have a third party looking at our supply chain and, and auditing it. And one of the, th so I, I mentioned this mission report we put out of you, but we were just interviewing a, a candidate for a summer intern. And she said, well, I like the mission report, but very rarely do people open up a, you know, a print thing and read through it. What you really need to do, and, and we are doing this, is you put it online, of course, but then you also create little video snippets. You know? And so you've got to find, we, we can provide the same information in much more bite-sized um, and accessible information. So we, that's on us to do that too. It could be shoppable too. I wrote a story about how L'Oreal's um, investor report was shoppable. So there you yeah, go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I do have one question um, since we have a, a bit of time to, to talk about that. So this is also, I mean, you talked earlier about um, this, this situation where a group of filmmakers went to, yep. you know, a fair trade, um, facility and just saw things that they weren't expecting perhaps but that people in the fair trade world recognize to be true that you know it's an amelioration process and that um you know like uh, it's it's all about context right. right um and you know we're seeing a lot of you know outrage you know from from millennials from and i consider myself part of this generation so i mean you know yeah. we you know we're very activist right and sometimes without you know that much knowledge um you know it, it can sometimes be um misdirected or applied in the wrong ways is that something that you think about or worry about or is this something that 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 uh, goes through your mind sometimes anybody <laughs> he wants to jump in uh, yeah, it does, because uh, even though the fair trade coffee world is very well established and there are many cooperatives in, in many different countries, there still are th things that go on that are not um, in line with the fair trade spirit. And I was actually just in Indonesia um, a couple weeks ago visiting two fair trade co-ops that are our main suppliers. It's actually our biggest origin. About a fifth of our volume is Fairtrade Organic from Sumatra. And for some 
reason that's still not clear to me, that origin is very different from the other fair trade origins that I've worked in and continue to work in. And there isn't that same um, sort of spirit of fair trade that you often find in other places. And it's really more of a business opportunity. And there's a, a history of you know, egregious violations of the, the standards um, with cooperatives being suspended and then decertified and then they pop up um, with a new name but the same people are involved and just all sorts of things that when you hear about them, it's like, ooh, like, that's just gross. It's, it makes me feel icky, and I don't want to have anything to do with those people. Um, so, you know, I think that we're always concerned that something may happen, um, but I think, fortunately, uh, most of the actors in the fair trade coffee world, most of the cooperatives, um, are legitimate, they're ethical, and they've maintained their certifications, um, and it's, you know, because they've been in the system for so long, I think that makes them um, already uh, viable business partners. And it's really the ones you don't know as much about or who might be new. You just kind of have to wait and see. Um, so I, you know, this is another reality in the fair trade world that I think um, often doesn't really get out because these are the, the stories that you don't want to hear about. Um, but you know, there, there are plenty of them. And um, unfortunately, they, they do taint um, the fair trade brand and, and model, but, um, it, it, you know, again, it's a business model, so these, you know, these things will happen at some point. Um, so I have one more line of inquiry, and, um, and then after that I'm going to um, um, open it up to audience questions, so if you have any questions that are brewing in your head now, you can, um, you can think, about, think about them, and then we can, um, we can uh, bring a mic over to you in a second. Um, but my last question for you is, um, is this one. Um, so over the last year, um, I've seen a dramatic um, increase in awareness um, about um, the environment. Um, and I, I, I pinpoint it to a couple of reports that were released last year. There was a UN report yep. that said that um, if we don't uh, begin um, you know, making pretty radical changes soon, um, the first um, really dire impacts uh, surrounding climate change will happen by 2030. Um, and so they're talking about massive food shortages, um, you know, even more natural disasters than we're seeing right now. There was also a, tr a Trump report that came out that year. Um, and there was also, last year was also the year when, um, you know, people started becoming aware of plastic. Um, I mean, obviously there have been people who have been talking about all of these things for a long time. But just as a reporter, I, I started seeing, you know, my readers just suddenly being much more aware of this. So we saw all the straw bans last year um, and people beginning to radically rethink their use of plastic. So there, there's something happening um, in the air, I think, um, where everyday people are start starting to be concerned about this. For me, I was really terrified. I have a three-year-old and by 20, 30, she's going to be graduating from college, and it just sounds like a, an utterly apocalyptic world she's going to be, you know, uh, walking into if, if we don't start changing things. So my question for you is this: I mean, you know, we're aware of how intersectional all of these issues are, right? Fair trade. I mean, uh, w when these disastrous things happen, I mean, humans are going to be affected, right? And people's livelihoods and their working conditions, um, all of that is going to be part of the equation. So how do you think about? the question of sustainability as you're, you know, as you're thinking about your future as a fair trade business. Um, I'm gonna put it out to anybody who, who's ready, who has, who has thought about an answer to that. I'll go first. I mean, for us, they're all, everything's in, intertwined, right? So for us, organic, as I said, organic has benefits for the workers, for their health, and certainly for the ecosystems they're in. And fair trade has benefits for the environment because as I, I talked about, educating women and girls is critical to, you know, for global sustainability as well. Um, so I, I, it, it, it's all part of the same um, effort, and I, I think it, you know, it's not a surprise that m I, there's extremely high overlap. Someone here from Fairtrade will know much better, but I, I think it's close to 90% of products that are Fairtrade certified are also organic, and that's not a, a, maybe that's not exactly right, but whatever it is, it's not an accident, it's not a coincidence. I mean, I think those just shows people are making the connections. Uh, yeah. Um, wow, but it, <laughs> <laughs> it's a big one. Yeah, it is a big one. I agree with you that the emphasis and the focus is shifting and people are making associations and, and really starting to want to respond to global climate change. 
Um, I think for us as an organization, we recognize the impact that we can have in changing some of our operations and some of our purchasing practices to help minimize the impact. Um, so we're taking some steps internally, you know, managing food waste, looking at our plastics and, mm -hmm. and expanding beyond some of those things that are socially driven, like reducing straws. Um, but it's, it, the global supply chain is so challenging um, that it's, it feels almost like the elephant is too big. And so we're, you know, just trying to do one thing at a time um, to, and yet do as much as we can at the same time. And I know that sounds crazy, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, it's such a huge issue. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, going back to that educational piece and um, educating our clients and our students and customers about how they can help us do our part, um, I think is really important. And, and it, just to build on what Laura said, it, it's also critical to get the right facts out there. So I, uh, on my flight here, I was reading my son's uh, senior thesis and it's really interesting because what he wrote, so he's at a university, they have this commitment to sustainability and they talk all about how important it is to source all of their meat locally. He's like, okay, well that's a nice, I understand the food miles, but if you really were thinking about sustainability and you were looking at the protein you're serving, you'd be thinking much more about plant protein. Um, you know, that's, so, you know, just yeah. so to so have a, um, it, for the, uh, an institution like that to actually have the facts around greenhouse gases, local meat versus plant-based meat is just a very different, it's a you know, factor, factorial difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a super complex <laughs> issue. Al, do you have any thoughts about this? Uh, and within our operations, we think about environment kind of in two different ways. One is the, um, the climate change that's happening at origin with coffee producers. And this is something that we've been hearing in the specialty industry for, I would say, coming on 10 years now. And it's something that we talk about quite a bit. There are seminars, um, uh, webinars about climate change. There was the, the panel this morning. And um, it's really scary when you hear producers, especially ones that you've been buying from and, and have gotten to know and have become friends with, talk about things like, oh yeah, the rains normally come during this period, but now there it's this period, or you never really know, or the rains didn't come at all, and the harvest dropped by X percent. And that has a real impact on us, because we generally are expecting to buy the same volume, if not more, from, from those producer partners. So it definitely affects our supply. I think something that's happening um, within our industry is that there are other origins uh, we call them emerging origins that have not um, really been part of the specialty industry, but they're improving the quality of their coffee and they're, they're coming into the market. And so, you know, in terms of actual supply of coffee, you know, I, at this point, I'm not super concerned that we won't be able to get the coffee we need. It just might be from places that we didn't before um, source from. The other side of the, the sort of environmental coin is what happens within our own operations, uh, particularly our cafes, because we have 20 of them, soon to be 21, and we go through a lot of disposable products, particularly cups, paper cups, plastic cups. And so this is something that we used to, I think, be more of a leader on back in the 2000s. We uh, started using uh, corn-based plastic uh, cups that were compostable. What we didn't know at the time was that they had to be composted in a commercial composting yeah. facility. You couldn't just throw them into your backyard compost bin and expect them to dissolve. It doesn't work that way. We didn't know that. Um, and then something happened. I was away from the company for actually um, over eight years and then went back. But during the period I was away, we discontinued purchasing those cups. Now we're back to looking at um, alternatives to the cups that we currently use. And I think a lot of it is from this um, sort of um, mass uh, sort of awareness of, of environmental issues, even more so than before. And I think that's good for, for company, companies like us because it kind of puts us on the spot. Like, hey, this is real and other companies are looking at this and they're doing things. We better kind of, you know, focus on this and, and make this a priority. Um, so I would say that's a, it's a plus, um, but it's also scary when you, when you look at what's happening and you know, you, you look at all the cups that we use and what's going out the door and going into the, the solid uh, waste stream, it's, it's like, ooh. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was going to actually ask about, so as my final question before I take it over to you guys, um, yeah, I was going to ask about packaging. And to me, it seems like, um, so obviously, you know, um, a very small amount of plastic actually gets recycled, even though we're all trying to do the best we can and we think it's recyclable. Um, so that's one, one aspect. But the other thing is just that, you know, uh, you know we're in this culture of overconsumption. Yep. And so as a, you know, as a retail and a fashion reporter, I'm seeing this with um, clothing. You know, we've, we've become accustomed to us buying way too many clothes and more clothes than we need. Um, and that's, that's part of the problem. And so, you know, in, in what you're doing, is that something you think about sure. that, um, you know, so, so on the one hand, there's like packaging, like trying to find better ways um, to sell, you know, to, and not assuming that because something's recyclable, your consumer's gonna recycle it. Um, and, but then also just like thinking about issues of consumption, like, sure. you know. You sure, know. so I mean, here's the contradiction we all live in, right? We, I think, can speak collectively. This group is committed to sustainability we all operate in a consumer economy. And so the definition of sustain is to nourish and uphold life. The definition of consume is to devour and destroy. Like, we're right in that, right? And so uh, for Honesty, packaging is our, by far our largest environmental footprint. We sell in both glass and plastic, and, and plastic has its downsides. Glass has its downsides. Glass is 18% heavier, and our single biggest um, expenditure of energy is in freight. So every time we ship glass, it's, we're shipping 18% you know, less product. Um, and I think the only way to um, be honest about it is just to recognize it, try to do everything we can to, to, to ameliorate our uh, impact. We, in Germany, have piloted a, um, selling a refillable glass bottle. So the bottle is sold and then brought back to the place of retail and cleaned and refilled like a, again. Like a milkman. Yeah, kind of exactly. System, yeah. So that's exciting. Um, in, in Europe and France, we're um, selling a plant-based polymer. So it's it not no petroleum, but then that is recyclable. So these are some positive steps, but at the end of the day, it's still a package. Um, there's still an environmental footprint. And, and I think, the, you know, uh, it's, it, like I say, it's, it's a journey, just as the journey is with fair trade, and we've been making progress. We're on that same journey with packaging, too. Yeah, um, I, one of our biggest challenges with packaging is that although we're a national organization, we operate in 300 different micro organizations across the country that have different state and local um, regulations and resources available. So, <clears throat> you know, crazy as it is, we have operations that don't have good access to recycling, that mm -hmm. don't have access to composting. So we have to have a multitude of different options available just to meet those campuses where they are currently. Yeah. Um, and then stay flexible and open when there are opportunities to do something different um, and, and help them push that envelope. So it's, it, it's extremely challenging. Just, just to build on that, so, so um, Alaska, as far as I know, has no glass recycling. So we had a debate like, should we even sell, is it ethical to sell product to Alaska? And, and I mean, if I, um, you know, we have a distributor that does bring, most of what we sell up there is plastic, which they do have recycling, but that's, that's kind of an interesting question. Yeah. Al, can I give you the last word and then we'll... Ooh, packaging. Um, <laughs> it, again, continuous improvement. We use packaging for our coffees, for our beverages, hot and cold. Um, it's something that we, we are looking at seriously now, um, just trying to reduce the footprint. Um, but it, it's complicated, and there are a lot of different options. Some cost more than others. Um, some are more durable than others. Uh, some of you know the bags of coffee you know may you know look good when they're flat, but when they're actually filled and presented on a shelf, may not look as good, and therefore are less appealing to the customer. Um, just a lot of things to consider, and um, but again, it's you know I think uh, the feedback feedback that we get from both customers and, and employees of the company, those are the, the things that often spur us to, to think more, just because we always have so many things going on, so many different projects. Um, when someone actually challenges us on, a, on an issue, um, you know, it's something that we have to f at least respond to, but then it, it often spurs a conversation that um, we'd all like to have, but you know, unfortunately, there are only so many conversations you can have in a day. So you know, I do appreciate the feedback we get from our customers, 
um, on things like packaging because it has led to changes in the past. Uh, one of the things we're looking at in uh, Bethesda Green, this nonprofit I started in our hometown, is letting the coffee shops use refillable, letting um, consumers bring in refillable cups and filling them. Often there's a health code concern. Is that something that you guys have? Um, it's not so much an issue, at least in Wisconsin. Um, so someone could, could bring a refillable cup in? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we would do that okay. quite a bit. Um, but Do they get a discount if they do that? Yes, okay. they do. I was going to ask that yeah, myself. Um, well, thank you so much for, uh, for being here for this discussion. Um, and thank you to my panelists. I think this was a really interesting and multifaceted discussion. The question was, if we're triple bottom line companies uh, and there's a trade-off, how do you reconcile that and how do you use it for marketing too? So at least at Honest Tea, the, the trade-off isn't around, we never said we're going to do less. It's more about the time frame. So we'll say, all right, we can't do everything fair trade now, or we can't do fair trade sugar now. We'll do what we can and make it clear um, that, you know, which direction we're headed in. And like I say, try to hold ourselves accountable to it. It's hard to um, give us, make too much marketing if we're not, you know, doing something um, that we know is what we'd like to be doing. So um, I think we just do our best to keep people educated and, 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 and you know, be open about the discussion. One, there was a time we brought out a product called Honest Fizz, and it wasn't organic. It was a, a, a soda, a zero calorie organic soda, and it wasn't organic, and it was really weird for us to bring out something that wasn't organic, and we, but we, on the package said, hey, this is from Honest, but it's not organic. What's going on? And we just said there wasn't a particular ingredient available, but we're working, and eventually it, it did become organic. So I think letting the consumer in on the conversation is the, the best way to handle something like that. Um, so for us, uh, because our model is a little bit different than traditional retail, um, what we've done is because we are such a huge organization and we're part of a large global organization, um, we actually actually leverage that scale with our vendors and our suppliers. So we have gone to our suppliers and said, okay, this is what we want. Um, certified humane eggs as an example and we need we are going to guarantee that we're going to purchase this um, this amount how can you help us leverage better pricing so that we can actually purchase that across the the entire organization so we've we've done that on several different initiatives and um, some suppliers are very open to, and vendors are very open to having those conversations others uh, it's a more robust conversation, <laughs> but we're still working on, on making some inroads because we don't want to pass those costs back to the consumer. It's, you know, it goes back to that discussion about democratizing you know, better product and, and better um, food and quality. When it comes to uh, buying coffee, um, and, and let's talk about fair trade coffee, there are, are oftentimes options. You can buy from Co-op A at X price or co-op B for Y price. And so you have to take things like the, the supply chain into question, the quality of the product. Um, you know, we could actually buy cheaper fair trade coffee than we do. And I'll use the case of Sumatra because I mentioned it before and I was just there. The two co-ops we buy from are on the higher end, if not the top end of the price spectrum for fair trade organic Sumatra. We know there's cheaper coffee out there. We know who has it. Uh, we work with importers who sell it. We just don't buy it, um, f that coffee from those importers because we have our existing producer uh, partners, the, the two co-ops that I was visiting, because their quality, for one, is excellent and is better than, um, I would say, the other coffees that are available from that same origin, but also the reputation um, of the cooperatives in a particularly um, tricky origin to work in and to source from. Um, and also when it comes to sort of long-term sustainability and partnership, we don't want to be jumping around from one co-op to another just based on price, even if that coffee is still being sold as fair trade organic and the customer doesn't know anything, doesn't know the difference. Um, and, you know, because it has the, the double certification, it may just be perceived as, oh, this is fine, it's fair trade organic, um, I trust that it's ethical. You know, it is, it has a certification, but, you know, what is it saying about us as a, as a business partner, if we're kind of bouncing around from one cup to another and, and really kind of, uh, I don't want to say bottom feeding, but looking for the cheapest deal. We want to work with producer partners who know who we are. Uh, we want to have a long-term relationship. We're willing to invest 
in them, we're willing to pay higher prices because we like them as people, we like them as business partners, we like the product, the quality of their products. Um, and so I think we, we have to think along those lines to, to really have a solid supply chain. And if it doesn't ever get communicated to the customer or even to other people in the company, because a lot of people in the company don't know that I make these decisions, that's fine. You know, I, I'm not, we're not out there to say, we do this, we do that, you know, we're so great, we're so ethical because we aren't always that great. And so I think it's really just going back to this, this idea of continuously improving and, and trying to establish uh, sustainable relationships with producer partners, fair trade or not, um, in different origins, so that you know, if, let's say, Brazil has a down year, we know we can still get great Brazilian coffee because the partners that we have have been working with us through thick and thin all these years. So, you know, I think there's, there's sometimes things that happen that customers, consumers often don't know about because it's, you know, sometimes it's just very tricky or, or uh, a lot of detail or it might not even be that interesting. But, um, you know, these are things that happen in the fair trade business world. So we have four minutes for one more question. Um. As three longer standing companies, are you worried about staying relevant in an economy that sells ethical choices to be successful? Um, as a consumer, I feel like I'm constantly inundated with ads, for example, on Instagram, um, for products that promise they'll, let's say, plant 10 trees if you buy this, or we'll give this much clean water to a village if you do that. Um, so do you think there's a preferred strategy in terms strictly as a business um, to provide these actions either through the supply chain or as an afterwards goodwill act. So saying, hey, you did this, now yeah. they get that, or yeah. saying this is part of who we are. So not just what you believe, but as a business, what do you think actually sells better? Yeah, so it's a really important question. Um, and obviously speaking now as a company that's owned by Coca-Cola, it's why these standards are so important. Right? We, we knew when we were a small independent company, people were going to give us the benefit of the doubt. You know, that we, you know, we certainly had the right aspiration, but there was no, when, uh, before we were fair trade certified, we didn't have any way to stipulate or, or uphold to a standard. And so it's especially important as big companies now start to get into this that there are third party verified um, uh, certifiers that have an objective standard that they enforce. And, and so um, I've, I've told people, uh, you know, consumers shouldn't trust a big company to do the right thing. They just shouldn't. I, and I'm not talking about Coca-Cola. That's just the way big companies work. So when you have a standard, it, it can't be compromised. And so it's obviously critical that we have rigorous enforcement and that we have real standards and they stand for something. But whether it's organic or fair trade certified, that's why these things are so important. And so I don't trust terms like, oh, we're socially responsible or we're doing the right thing or we respect the health or or even direct trade. I mean, we did got, we, when, when fair trade sort of had the evolution a few years ago, we did have that moment. Should we try to do direct trade? And I knew we can't because someone's gonna say it's part of a big company and when things get tough or Seth leaves, they're gonna look for a shortcut. And, and um, that's why the standards are so important and there's really no substitute for it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> this is, um, what you mentioned, the, you know, we'll plant trees or do this if you buy the X. To me, that just feels so um, disingenuous about what that organization might be standing for. Um, you know, it, for, uh, you, to your point, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we are trying and doing, trying to balance, I think, multiple inputs and multiple stakeholder needs, and they don't always match up perfectly. Um, but I, I also think that just having this focus and an emphasis on it and being aware is part of a standard set of expectations that consumers have now. And that is more important than committing to doing something in return for purchasing whatever the product may be. Um, we uh, entertained discussions of carbon credits like 10 years ago and abandoned that really quickly because <laughs> I think it's far more important for us to actually do things that have a better impact than trying to offset it by yep. buying something else. So it's just... Yeah, I agree. And just to build on that, I mean, any company can give money to a charity 
and, and, and make it look good. The key with fair trade is it's embedded in the business practice. And, and I've always said, look, I, for the first 10 years, Honesty was a nonprofit. So you know, we gave away all our profits. That didn't mean anything. But every time we bought tea, we were investing back into these communities through a, a standards that you know, made sure we were you know, doing the right thing. And, and that's, that's what's important. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for being here for this discussion. Um, and thank you to my panelists. I think this was a really um, interesting and multifaceted discussion. Um, so, um, so thank you. And I, I think it's tea time now, right? So, oh, it's always tea time. I know. <laughs> so, coffee um, break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and coffee too. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.